Welcome to Novel Spotlight, the podcast where published fiction writers are interviewed to gather their insights and writing lessons so we can use them to make ourselves better and more effective writers. Now, on with our program. Thank you for listening. This is your host, Mike Consul. In the spotlight is Indian American novelist Sonali Deb. Hi, everyone. I'm so excited to be here. I'm Sonali Dev, and I'm coming to you from uh, the suburbs of Chicago. And my ninth novel, The Vibrant Years, just came out, and it launches Mindy Kaling's publishing imprint, Mindy's Book Studio. So a lot of fun stuff has been happening, and I can't wait to share it with all of you. And uh, as Sonali has said, her imprint, the, uh, Mindy Kaling's got a new book imprint, Mindy's Book Studio, it's called. This is done in collaboration. And Sonali, you you correct me along the way here if I get anything wrong here, but she's doing this in collaboration with uh, Amazon. And you can think in terms of some of the other celebrities who have uh, basically book clubs or they promote books or they have a label such as Oprah Winfrey or, or Reese Witherspoon and so on. There's actually quite a few of them out there right now. But Mindy Kaling is really looking to, in fact, I'm going to quote from her. She says, throughout my career, I've been labeled as sort of a, a, a sort of unusual and an outlier for someone from my background. What I'm finding more and more is that I'm not that unusual. And there's tons of women of color who are interested in comedy and write these incredibly funny books. And I just want to help people get to see them. And again, that's uh, Mindy Kaling, uh, famous from The Office, and then The Mindy Project, uh, her own TV show. She's been in movies. She's very successful, very famous. Sonali, how did your book come to her attention, or how did you meet Mindy? Do you know her personally, or how did she uh, end up saying, hey, your, your new book, I'd like to uh, have it on my imprint and back it in some way? So I think it's one of those things, um, you know, like we say, a preparation meeting opportunity. <laughs> so we um, have both been doing um, what we do for a while, which is, you know, tell stories. And I think one of the most special things for me about um, this collaboration and about The Vibrant Years being the book to launch Mindy's Book Studio is the fact that unlike the other celebrities, uh, Mindy is first and foremost a writer. So she was a writer on The Office. Um, you know, she has written, of course, The Mindy Project. She's part of the um, creators of Sex Life of College Girls, which is an absolutely fabulous show on HBO right now. So, so to me, I have always been a huge fan of her writing and what she has done for creators of color for storytellers of color is she has changed the game for us she has changed the landscape uh she has made our stories you use the word accessible she has made our stories reach a lot of people who thought they didn't need our voices and our, our stories in their life so when i started um you know, when I started writing and when I was trying to get published, there was basically this general sense, and this was about a decade ago, there was this general sense that there was no need or place for um, for stories told by people of color and women of color, voices that were different from what all, already existed on the shelves. So I, uh, you know, so, so I came into that and over the past 10 years, a lot has changed. And I think Mindy is a large part of that. A lot of creatives uh, who have been doing, you know, tirelessly working are a part of that. So that was the most special part of this for me in terms of how we came together. Uh, no, we didn't know each other, although in my head, I feel like I do, like all of us feel like we know um, people whose work we consume and enjoy. But Mindy was getting into publishing. So how how this is different, I think, from book clubs is the fact that she this is an actual publishing imprint. So she, uh, you know, she is the one who acquires or her company, Mindy's Book Studio, is the one who acquires the stories, is, uh, you know, publishes them, all of that. And um, and and she was out there starting this new venture in partnership with uh, Amazon who has, as you know, uh, the Kindle and this great reach 
in terms of readership, which is very powerful for people who want their stories heard. And I was, um, you know, I had already written this story, which was such a culmination of, um, you know, what I wanted to say about being a woman. And I hopefully will get to talk a little bit about that. I was also coming out of the pandemic where I feel like comedy saved me consuming comedy, watching it, reading it was what helped me survive in the healthiest possible way. And so when I came out of it, I knew my stories were going to really dig into that that part of it, making people laugh. And so I had been studying Mindy's work because I think, you know, she does humor from a place of vulnerability and from a place of character, which really appealed to me. So all of that was kind of going on in these two separate universes, Mindy's and mine. And um, and when this book was written and it was out there uh, being subbed, you know, being submitted to publishers, she happened to be starting this thing and it was a perfect fit. So it's really serendipitous and it really is... Um, preparation um and manifestation meeting opportunity right right you know um here you are a best-selling author you're um, american indian or indian american i should say it the other way around uh, uh not to confuse you with the with the um indigenous people of the americas but uh it's already been established that there is a huge audience in this country for uh india-based storylines i'm thinking in terms of slumdog millionaire which brought big audiences out won the best picture of the year i do believe and uh, the people in those theaters were not all indians there, there was lots of white people and people of all kinds of different colors so i'm thinking in terms of here you are writing romance comedic romance novels uh you i assume i'm assuming that your books are also translated in, into hindi and that uh, you may be very popular in India as well, which is a huge, what, a 1.3 or 4 billion person country. Is that the case? Are you are you very well read in, in India or is your audience uh, really strictly the Americas? So, so there's a lot going going on uh, with your question. And um, I'll start with addressing, I mean, first, the easiest thing to address is a lot of the readership in India is English, you know, because of colonization, a large population of the country studies in, you know, in, in the medium of education is English. And so the medium of uh, communication in terms of, um, you know, how books are consumed is often English. So my books are sold in English in India. They're the Indian version of of it and um the other piece of it is um that my narrative and uh you know my my stories my perspective is obviously very uh you know is is as much american as it is indian in as much as you know the hyphenated identities exist and a lot of what uh what my stories dig into is that is that act of um you know, making home in a new place of really uh, owning your home and and what that journey is and going back, um, you know, to Slumdog Millionaire for 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 decades now, um, ever since probably the first um, Indian story that some of the first were even I think Mississippi Masala, which was a, a you know Mira Nair film back in the eighties. So, so this, um, you know, this idea that it is very, it's already part of the mainstream is actually not true, because if we were to dig into the past few decades, we would find very few examples. And most of those, um, you know, are narratives of pain, like Slumdog Millionaire is, you know, what a, a terrible word to, uh, term to use for it is poverty porn, right? Mm -hmm. And, and brown pain, and a lot of uh, fiction that we have seen in 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 the past century, e if it's even seen at all, has been about pain. And I think that that is an easier narrative to consume because that's all that's been available for the Western uh, reader and the Western consumer. I think that that is um, really problematic, and um, because. I can assure you that there aren't that every immigrant doesn't wake up in the morning, look at themselves in the mirror and bemoan their brownness, right? We have very full, um, you know, very fun, very painful, very human lives and um and and stories where 
we just happen to be the protagonists, but our journeys are universal and are human, are the kind of narratives that we are now starting to see. And I am really, uh, you know, that's the space that I would like to be in. And I think a lot of South Asian storytellers and um, creators feel that way. So it is it's it is a new space. The world has changed. Um, you know, there's been a paradigm shift with what has happened in uh, in in our voices even being allowed and accepted over this decade. And it is wonderful, but we do have a very long way to go. Um, and and um, of course, it cannot be that Indian Americans are my only audience. We are about 1% of America's population. And um, the readership, you know, and, and we're very integral to... Um, you know, to this country and its culture. And I think that that finding your space in the mainstream, finding your space in the fabric is really what I'm aspiring to. And I think what a lot of uh, authors of color and creators of color are aspiring to. Well, surely, though, there's, you know, there's these cultural differences uh, that you, uh, I'm sure, weave into your novels. For for example, I've known uh, Indian women who they live at home until they get married. It's just it's what their parents want them to do It's part of the culture. And and then there's the caste system, which I, I know Indian people who wanted to get married and their parents were dead set against it because they were from different castes. Uh, do you talk a little bit about that and how much that comes into play in your books? I realize that you're not an Indian writer writing only about Indians. You're, you're uh, uh, broader than that. Um, but the culture, you're bringing the culture to life at the same time, correct? Yes, but the one thing, if you had to walk away with one thing that you learned about Indian culture, it is that it is as far from a monolith as any culture can be, right? Um, and, and the easiest way to explain this is if an, you know, if an invader came into Europe, um, took it over for two centuries, and then, you know, turned it into the umbrella of one nation so it has you know so so switzerland and france and um, england and all of these countries are entirely formed separate cultures there is a europeanness that ties them together but um but but each culture is fully formed with a full even if you know with a full literary tradition but even basic things like language and dress and food and all of it is 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 different and india is like that it is a hundred cultures within one nation so generalization is an incredibly hard thing to do so taking one story or one indian person you've met and extrapolating it is is even more fraught with potholes than i think doing that for say an american person right if you meet someone from new york to think oh their story um their voice everything is going to be really different from someone from texas you know or florida take that and multiply it a hundred times bring into it different culture uh, different religions sub-religions um you know uh, urban versus rural anglicized versus not there is just no uh, you know and uh, uh, also you know speaking a different language at home eating different food at home having different kinds of relationships there's just too many metrics in there to generalize it under you know one thing or for me to speak to all of indian culture so i think specificity in fiction is um you know again what makes it real because if i have walked um you know in the shoes of a, a winemaker in new england then the specificness of the place of that piece of american culture is really what makes my journey meaningful through the consumption of one story and if you have read for instance if you read the vibrant years it is very specific to one piece of indian culture the family is originally from goa which is you know which was under portuguese rule for until the 60s which is a very specific kind of um cultural mixing because it's it's kind of the seat of catholicism but also um a lot of the goan maharashtrian or konkani culture 
exists there. And this family is, uh, the daughter-in-law is a Goan Catholic who is born and raised in, um, you know, West Palm Beach, Florida. And the the mother-in-law, who is the main character, is someone who is, you know, Maharashtrian Goan and moved here in her 40s. And so that's a very specific kind of culture. And what I can say in terms of that story is speak to that culture, showcase that culture, but again, only from the perspective of this one person and her experiences. Yeah, it's a microcosm. So, so, so the is. vibrant years, which is coming out, um, is, is it out or, or is it? It's still. Um, it's pending? it's very much out. It's very much out. It's you can out. buy it. Yes, so, buy it everywhere. So, books are sold. Yes. So what Sonali's talking about, she's got a 65-year-old protagonist named Bindu. She inherits a million dollars. She's astounded and horrified when she gets this money. And the, the windfall threatens to expose a, a shameful mistake from her youth. And uh, she's desperate to keep the secret. Uh, and Bindu quickly spends it, that money, on something unexpected, a, a condo in a posh retirement community in Florida. Uh, you said West Palm Beach specifically is, is no, where she no. The, the story is that's where Ali Alicia is born and raised, but the story takes place in Naples, Florida. In Naples, okay, beautiful Naples. Yes, um, you have written. I mean, I look at you, Sonali, and I see a young woman who's written a lot of books. I mean, this is number. Did you say number nine or number ten? So this is my ninth full length novel, but it is my 11th story because I have two shorter novellas short slash short stories. So you're very productive. Talk about your routine. How often do you write? When do you write? Is there a certain time of day that you always make sure to write? Is there a certain venue that you uh, like to be in uh, when you write a writing room or the or whatever? Talk, uh, talk about the methodology you use for producing your work. I I do. Um, the first thing I'll say is that I do write full time. So when you think in terms of, and I have about a book out a year. And, um, you know, although this past year was incredibly productive for me, I had, uh, you know, two books and a short story out. But that's not, that's not usual for me I was just kind of veering into something new and of course the pandemic gave us all a lot a lot more time and mental space if we knew you know if if we reached for it and if that was possible for us but um my you know I I will say that I do something that is related to writing every single day um but my writing process is very chaotic and um really hard to explain it's these you know, ebbs and cre- um, you know, for dips of intense activity. So when I'm writing a first draft, I can work, you know, 10 hour days where, um, you know, personal hygiene goes out the door where <laughs> I barely, you know, get out of my jammies. I basically, uh, you know, have this very, um, I, I go inside my uh, cocoon and, um, and basically get, lose myself in it and then almost frantically get this first draft out, which is, um, you know, which is almost a glorified outline, but it is the time that I'm figuring the story out. I'm figuring out what I want to say. And then all of my magic really, um, I believe, happens in revisions. Once I have that thing out, then I know what to do. And then my revision is much more a place where I feel a little bit more in control, where I kind of know what I'm doing because it's there. And then, you know, I can I can turn it into something. My clay is there. But I think that that first, uh, you know, even f- even digging up the clay part is um, is for me the most intense. After that, I become a little bit more, you know, a little bit less frantic. And I have, I you know, I have... M- m- I can do other things during my day and my family um, heaves a sigh of relief. But so, so it is, it's kind of erratic, but, um, but I, I do work in spurts, even with revisions, when they come back from my editor, I work in spurts, then I really need to rest my brain. So, so I think a large part of my process is also filling the well and, um, you know, and taking care of my mental energy and making sure, because um, I, I think for me, especially, and I'm sure this is true of everybody who has, a, you know, a job where they, where they create, um, is that I treat my brain like a muscle, and I treat my ba- brain very much like my body, and I protect it, and I exercise it, and, you know, I, I How do you exercise it? 
in addition to the writing, are there other things you do that exercises the mind? I think does diet come into play at all? I mean, are you a person who eats a healthy diet as well? How, how do you how do you protect the your 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 mental capacity and creativity? Absolutely. I, and, and, you know, it's interesting that you picked out exercise because I do think that physical exercise does do that for me mentally. Also, dancing is a thing that, you know, that kind of is very important uh, to me. I it, it brings together this, there's this mind-body connection that goes with it. Yoga is that way too. And um, and so so even physical activity, a lot of walking, which is something I have picked up again you know, in the past few years in during the pandemic, when um, when gym, gyms were closed, I always thought walking was a thing my older parents did. You know, it would mean <laughs> it would mean um, I have crossed over <laughs> to the to the other side. You become and I your have, parents. Yeah. <laughs> I have. I have. And I really enjoy walking. And I think walking really frees the mind. I think meeting people, this is an incredibly important thing to me and keeping, um, you know, keeping interactions meaningful, uh, conversations you have with people, observing them, travel is a huge part of it. We, we travel extensively, but traveling even in ways of just sitting, you know, in a place um, and, and just observing people. So all of that comes into play, cooking, conversations with my children, a lot of contemplation of where I've come from, where every single thought that comes into my mind, where it was seeded, you know, in terms of either my childhood or an experience I had growing up. So a lot of contemplation, a lot of conversations with people and just being mindful of it, you know, just just kind of trying to understand how is my brain feeling today? Is it filled with thoughts? Is it, you know, is it calm? Uh, you know, is it, I, I actually, I don't know if this happens to everybody, but, you know, after you've had a really heavy workout, how your muscles hurt, there are times when my my brain actually feels like that, that it is, that it really needs to rest. And that rest, mm -hmm. some days can be staring out um, you know, of my window. Some days it can be cuddling with my puppy. Some days it can be just mindlessly binging, you know, uh, shows and TV. Some days it's getting lost in someone else's words. So do you meditate? To it. Are you a meditator? Um, I am. Uh, I'm on and off, not as much as I would like to be, but I do really enjoy yoga. And I find, uh, you know, I find that the, the, the whole like really falling into myself that mind body thing is um is is something that really gives me a lot of um, power and uh kind of puts me back together i i meditate less than i would like to but i think i try to be meditative with my thoughts you and know I, staring out a window as you were saying yeah, that's yeah. almost a form of meditation really uh i i don't know what you're looking at but if you're just basically taking time and being still just kind of that stillness yeah, is, uh, many people would yeah. say is a form of meditation. Yeah, emptying your mind. So, you know, that's that's the ultimate rest because you're also connecting with what's under your mind, right? Um, that that energy that's you, what however you describe it, but just connecting with that. That I try to, you know, that I try to do through the day um, as often as I can. So what influences your writing? You, you're, you're doing romance, you're doing comedy, there's culture in there. But what, what kind of things have happened in your life or that you're interested in that are some of the inputs of your writing? I think my, you know, intrinsic um, exploration or the intrinsic journey that I am trying to figure out is, um, you know, is, is the feminine journey. So it is it is this um, experience of being a woman in the world today, because, um, you know, I, I don't know a single woman, no matter what culture, you know, she's from or age um, she is, who doesn't feel like she walks this tightrope between expectation, between everything she's been taught all the conditioning that starts to fall on our head from the day we're born and personal freedom. Right. And what that even means, because so much of our identity from the day we're born is based in, you know, 
um, in how in motherhood and um, being a wife and being a daughter and how we look and um, you know making a home domesticity even today those are things that even women who have chosen to deal with it, they've had to deal with it. So even today, we're not free of that. And, um, you know, I, I think it's that journey, taking the time to realize what, who I am and what I want and what does all the things I've been told through my life have to do with that. I think every one of my um, journeys is that, is breaking conditioning, um, but breaking conditioning in a way that, uh, you know, that, as I said, said, is mindful and focuses on what makes me feel whole. And I think every one of those characters, even my love stories, because I feel like romances or love stories are not about finding a significant other. What they are about is getting to a place where you are okay enough with yourself that you can let love in because you can't even accept love if you haven't learned that for yourself right until you accept who you are everybody if someone else even accepts you or sees you that's not a reality to you because you're not seeing yourself so the real journey is about that is about you know getting to the place where you can even let that in and that is a place of recognizing who am i and so so i think that's what these stories are for me now, you're obviously a free thinking woman, but you're also a traditional woman, correct? Because you're you're mm -hmm. married and you have two children, two teenage children. I believe they're teenage uh, in years. So you live what would on the surface anyway, would be seen as a traditional life, uh, you know, married, married with children, uh, just as your husband is living a traditional life for a man. Um, do you. I want to drill down a little bit on the characters in your in your novels in terms of how much of what you write do you feel is tradition bound versus um kind of the footloose fancy free uh kind of new era type type stuff does that question make any sense to you Sonali? it absolutely absolutely makes sense and um and i think that's that's what i was trying to say is that it's the journey between those two things i don't think that um, anyone is completely one thing, right? And and that exactly is what I'm talking about, right? To to, to kind of, um, what does it mean when when I say that I do have a very traditional life in terms of um, you know, and I have two adult children now; they're 21 and 23. But um, everything we know about parenting right how our parents parented us how our grandparents parented them and how we parent right that obviously so much of what we're told we should be doing we have found to be ineffective because the world is constantly changing right relationships um in terms of um marriages again uh how our parents marriages worked uh, which was the blueprint you know for our marriage in terms of what we learned in our muscle memory so much of it is deconditioning that and realizing well this doesn't work this doesn't work for us or this does work you know so so making those um you know making that journey i think that is more important to me than um than saying a person is x and a person is y right growing up um i and and to give you a, a background I think where this comes from is growing I grew up in a family that was um you know to use a very simplistic word very progressive I we we were two siblings I had an older brother and myself so my parents had a son and a daughter and never made any um difference between them and they were vocal about it but we lived in a world where where people had to say that had to say my son and daughter are the same which tells you that they are not because why would you have to say it right and every little thing like like women are told oh you can do anything you want you can be anything you want the fact that we are having to be told that means that it isn't that simple and so I lived in a home where there was equity where there was understanding where both my my brother and my voices mattered just as much my parents marriage was very much you know a, a, a space of the kind of 
equity I did not see anywhere else in marriages around me. And so the moment I stepped outside of my home, there was such a stark contrast in the messaging I was getting, in the stories I was reading, in my friends, families, everywhere around me, that it became very early in life I started to see you know, the disconnects. I started to to identify lies that we were being told about what we had to be to be okay. And um, and, and I think that, that that became very much part of uh, who I am. And then I had children and the same thing again, right? You're supposed to parent in this way, otherwise your children are going to go haywire or whatever, this place of fear that we're told to live in. And I think all of uh, so- societal structure and the patriarchy is based in fear right? Because we are taught that if we break it, if we change it, if we tip it, everything's going to get destroyed. And my books are often about that or about, you know, Bindu makes, you know, is a certain kind of person when she's young, but the choices she makes are considered so destructive that she has to put a part of herself away. And it's not until she is in her 60s that she gets a chance to revisit it. And, uh, and the same is true, Ali, who is, um, you know, her daughter-in-law, who is, the, this is three generations of women, right? The book is, has protagonists who are three generations of women. And the, the daughter-in-law who is, you know, closest to me in age, she is 47. She's recently divorced. And her divorce, um, the main reason for her divorce was that she has dared to give herself to a career that is really hard in a way that has been difficult for her her husband to deal with. And so it has to do with women, their desires and what it does to their lives, the collateral Mm -hmm. damage of that. So I I think, does that answer your question? (laughs) It does. Now, I I do want to ask you about your book, Recipe for Persuasion. Uh, The readout on this one is, here's your protagonist. He's California's first Indian American gubernatorial candidate. Um, has always known exactly what he wants uh, and how to use his privileged background to get it. He attributes his success to a simple mantra, which is control your feelings and you can control the world. But when a hate crime at a rally critically injures a friend, um, his easy life suddenly feels like a lie. His control seems to have been an illusion and uh, when he tries to get back on the campaign trail, he blacks out with panic. That's a heavy theme. You're, you're a romance and comedic writer, but that's a very heavy theme. Do, are people going to come away from that book uh, with, uh, uh, is that, does that book uh, fit the mold where there's romance and comedy in there? Or is that one a, a little bit more downcast because of the, the, the gravitas of the subject matter? So first, that book is uh, in sense and sensibility, not a uh, recipe for persuasion. Oh, I got and, the title wrong. There? Yeah. Oh, I see. Okay, I just see. Which is, All right, you're yes. Which is Sorry totally fine. Which is totally fine. yes. So I so my books um are even the ones that are laugh out loud funny like the vibrant tears are definitely the basis. Are uh, you know is always um is always societal messaging and you know the trauma it causes at worst or the hardships it causes and um and and yash's life so this entire i wrote a series of four novels which were homages to my four favorite jane austen novels and they are uh, set in you know in this politically ambitious Indian American family in the Bay Area that's descended from Indian royalty. And so I was kind of, you know, trying to do two things. And their oldest son is Yash, who is running for California governor. And and, uh, I think the journey of this family is a, um, you know, I wanted to probe a little bit and explore a little bit what brown privilege looks like in, um, you know, in the world we live in. And the other thing was the immigration, you know, we we kind of dial down into it from a place of individual angst, right? But the journey of immigrating to a place, leaving the comfort of your home and going somewhere else, A, it is 
you know, I, I say this to my, my brother still, you know, my brother lives in India and I live here and we both have really fabulous lives. And I always say that I'm a nomad and he's a tree. And I feel like all humans are kind of divided into those two things. Mm -hmm. So, you know, either you're rooted or you just have, uh, you know, have this sense of adventure uh, to see what else is out there. Right. And so it's, it's just two different kinds of people. So any immigrant to leave there, whether it is from a place of trauma and it's, you know, you're a refugee or it is from a place of seeking adventure and a better life. You just have to be a different kind of person to do it because nobody who doesn't have, you know, doesn't have that uh, that gene, if you will, of, um, of, of not caring if everything will blow up for what they seek that's kind of you know the heart of every person who leaves their comfort zone and so immigrant stories at their heart when they are sad that that's that I feel like as a lens doesn't work for me because as a lens it is a person who intrinsically is uh, you know is is okay with change who is intrinsically seeking it even if they're you know even if externally they haven't made that journey yet and then with this particular series of books, I was looking at what it looks like when you, uh, you know, when you immigrate, uh, when you make a new place, your home, you know, there are, there are, it's a ladder, right? You take one step, one step, one step closer to really owning it. And I think the, you know, the ultimate step to owning your new home is political power, where you are, you are saying, I will now be part of decisions that are made. You know, I, I will be part of the decision making process and the governance of this place. And so political power feels like the less, you know, the last um, kind of one of the latter steps in this journey. And so this family is already coming from a place of generational power, um, but complicated gen generational power with the whole history of colonization and princely states or kingdoms. And um, and here they are saying, uh, we now seek political power in this new place. And so the family's um, you know, journey includes Yash's gubernatorial run and then you know, they hope for even more after that. And um, and and so yes, I mean, is the the story is not ha ha laugh out loud. It deals with um, you know starts with a hate crime, but but it is really about healing and it's about placing your own ambitions and wants in the context of, of those of the people around you because he is carrying a lot of dreams for a lot of people, and that mm -hmm. that is also his dream. But he has put away large parts of his himself and a before. burden. And a burden it, when you carry people's dreams, you know? It is, it is. He but... blacks out. I'm wondering <laughs> if that stress, the stress of understanding just, just how much is at stake. Well, in the hate crime alone would make yes. somebody very, you know, uh, aware that, you know, I could easily be a target. This is this is really ugly stuff. And it, um, But at the same time, just I'm carrying all these people's dreams and that's a tremendous amount of pressure. Right. And he yes. is a person, as often people in that situation are, where every time something's in his way, including past trauma, he has simply buried it because he has no time for it. Right. And I think that in the modern world today, that it is something we all do. We have no time to deal with the things and we bury them. I think mental illness and the rise of, um, you know, those challenges is is because the mind, you know, because we're not taking the time. And until we take the time to, to um, you know, come face to face with the things that have traumatized us in, a, in the past, there is no getting past them. They're going to blow up at some point. And I think that this, when the assassination attempt happens, just purely from Yash's perspective, he can no longer, he has swept too much under his, you know, emotional carpet that he can no longer keep going until he goes back to that and faces that stuff and figures out why he's doing what he's doing instead of just doing it. Right. And you know, there are, and there are a lot of, I don't know how many people are aware of this, uh, but there's a lot of celebrities out there who suffer from anxiety, uh, kind of this blackout sort of thing of this tremendous anxiety. They've built a career. A lot of people don't realize how much effort has to go into building a career to get where you're at. But then it's not just getting where you're at to maintain it. There's a lot of pressure to continue to produce, to maintain 
your celebrityhood, your your income, and that weighs very heavily on people. So there's that that, that anxiety um, is is very prevalent uh, among people who we consider to be people living very uh, you know luxurious lives and very easy lives, and that's not always the case. Now, in the case of incense and sensibility, the other thing that's jumped out at me is the illusion that you also hit that theme and I, I don't know whether you hit it in this particular way but think in terms of people who have control who are privileged let's say as as uh as uh, yash is in your in in sense and sensibility and something happens that suddenly awakes and it happens to everybody you suddenly realize i really am not in control here there's there's forces at play that i have no control over and even my attempt to control my little piece of the world even that is not assured absolutely absolutely and i and you know in, in in the uh the device i use here of course is um you know is the love story and and the, the hiding and the lies right i mean yash has literally been in a in a relationship which is fake with you know with his best friend they both want to do things that their families and their situations don't allow them to do so they use each other and they they basically tell the families that they are in a relationship when they're not and then when he's you know and it just becomes such a crutch for both of them and i tell you know his his um his fake fiance story in the next book which is the emma project but in this book they they're both lying to the whole world and a lot of yash's politics is based on finally telling the truth and there's this huge um uh, you know dichotomy there and um and he needs to kind of stop and figure out what it means to tell the truth right it can't just be intent the intention uh it actually whether it is the truth or not also matters and just just by um omission if it's a truth by omission then you know is that not a lie and and the the woman he ends up with is uh you know is a yoga guru and a stress management uh guru who who kind of is the exact opposite of him where living authentically is all she's ever done and um and and you know he um the only way he can have a relationship with her is a je you know jeopardize his uh, his run uh, for governor and tell everybody he's been lying or have a relationship with her and lie which is something she cannot do so it it i think the major theme of this book for me was you know what is truth and how easily we tell little lies and and because they don't you know we tell ourselves they don't cause harm we don't even identify them as lies so right. that's kind of a part of his journey and india's journey too mm -hmm. you know uh i think that's really clever what you do with with some of your book titles you mentioned your four favorite jane austen novels so you've got uh there's sense and sensibility you've got incense and sensibility there's pride and prejudice you have pride prejudice and other flavors it creates i i want to ask you whether I mean, I think those titles create a sense of familiarity with the reader right off the bat. And so often I can look at a title of a book and I think I, it, there's no real connection there. It's just a title. Is this Was this a strategic decision on your part? Was it more whimsical? Because uh, it makes a lot of sense to try to create that that sense of I know this or familiarity for the reader with a title so that they take more than just a passing look and then move on to, to the, the rest of what's on the shelf or the rest of what's on the computer screen. What about that? I think that they, they're definitely tongue in cheek, but as I said, these are homages to Jane Austen novels. And we did, um, my publisher and I did give, uh, you know, give it a thought, uh, try to figure out if, um, if making that obvious in the title was a good strategy or not you know one there are several retellings like clueless is a retelling of emma but the name itself doesn't um uh, you know tell you that at all so that is one strategy however bride and prejudice which is a you know, film adaptation of Pride and Prejudice tells you right up front. So we made the choice to go with names, uh, you know, that that do pay homage to Jane Austen and tell you that these are Jane Austen. Um, you know, I hate using the term retelling because mine are so far from the original. They're just thematic 
uh, retellings, their homages to the basic themes of uh, Jane Austen's novels and uh, modernized, you know, the themes modernized, not even the plot modernized. So, so we did, once we had made the choice with the first one that we were going to stick with titles, then it was, uh, you know, then it was a question of finding a title that was meaningful to my story and still paid you know, uh, not gave a nod to the original and Pride, Prejudice and Other Flavors is a is kind of a gender swapped Pride and Prejudice with, um, you know, Lizzie Bennett is um, is a is a, a male chef. And um, and so that there's a lot of the th themes are very um, heavily uh, food based the there's a there's a lot of connection between characters through food the second one is you know set on a uh, recipe for persuasion is persuasion but it is set on a food network game show and uh at, like the original persuasion is a second chance at a lost first love in sense and sensibility of course is sense and sensibility and she is a yoga guru, so incense and sensibility, you know, and her mom is an incense maker. So it, it very much kind of um, speaks to what my book is. And the Emma project is, um, you know, is Emma and it is uh, Emma, but instead of matchmaking, to me, the base theme of Emma was charity, was a person who has everything, was a have um you know, trying to, was someone who has everything, a person of privilege, thinking she knows or he knows what is best for someone who has less, which is what the original Emma to me was, where the matchmaking is simply this this woman who has everything and, uh, and, and is bored with her life because she has everything, trying to rewrite the life of another woman who already is in love. But she says to her, Oh, but that's not the right person for you. Let me find you the right person, which is, I think, in today's day and age with the GoFundMes and the billionaires giving away their, you know, uh, their billions is a matter of using what you have to change the world, but from your perspective. And uh, and I think that's that, you know, so so the Emma project kind of digs into that aspect of it. Mm -hmm. Now, um, how many are your books uh, uh, in uh, translated into other languages yes uh i most of them are i i think you know spanish romanian indonesian hebrew um and i'm not sure which one you know how many into how many the vibrant years mm -hmm. not yet but yes so uh you know enlighten me on i know that india is an english-speaking country but I was under the impression that not everybody speaks English there, that if you're part of the underclass and maybe didn't get the uh, same education as everybody else. Or is it the case that that anybody you, you meet in India would have facility with the English language? No, absolutely. I wouldn't say that it is um, an entire, uh, you know, the, the entire, um, I think there is like five or 10 percent of the country. So it is as a percentage of the country, a, a small percentage of it. Um, is educated in English and speaks English, but uh, but but most people have some familiarity with it. Mm -hmm. So, but uh, just in terms of uh, again getting back to that earlier question about the book being translated into Hindi, does that not make sense uh, for for India? Since um, I would think that that uh, Indians abroad, Indians who live overseas in a place like the United States, who are citizens here, um, could be of of interest. Um, like like is the case with a lot of other cultures. Oh yes, absolutely. But I think a lot of people who might, you know, and, and yeah, I mean, nothing against it being. Um, uh, my, I, I'm from Maharashtra. I'm from Mumbai, and um, my language speaks Maharashtra. I mean, my family speaks Marathi and um, I'm perfectly trilingual so Marathi Hindi and English but um, I, I you know I would absolutely be thrilled if it were translated I don't think that's so much the norm because English books sell in India um, in English and um, I, I think that it isn't very common for western literature um, unless it's really canon to be um, to be translated but if it is you mm -hmm. know um my my the single one thing i want in life is for more people to read my stories 
How involved do you get in the marketing of your books? Um, Are you a social media maven? <laughs> I wouldn't say maven. I am on social media. I, um, you know, I, I try to use it in as much as it is fun for me, rather than as uh, as as a way to um, in any way, you know, um, to sell books. And by that, I mean I don't know exactly what there's no way for me to know what return on investment for time and things like that is. So I love to interact with readers and I, you know, like to say um, things about um, social, you know, I, I, I like to make social commentary and in, in that much I and share my life in as much as I can. And so it's, it's really a fun place for me to interact with readers rather than as a marketing tool. Um, I leave that to, um, you know, I leave that to the professionals and um, I, you know, marketing, who knows? I mean, if anyone can tell you exactly what works and what doesn't, um, I would like to know, but I don't think there is any real way to know. My take on the matter is I know how to write books. And so long as I write really good books, then someone will know how to market them. Are you working on your next one already? Absolutely. I'm in the throes of it. Uh, it is. Um, can you tell us a little about it? Um, I can tell you very little about it. And that is that it is um, the story of a very close friendship that broke up 27 years ago because of a surrogacy arrangement that went wrong. And now 27 years later, something has kind of thrown everything open and um, they're having to revisit this friendship that they put away that used to be, you know, almost like a soulmate connection. Uh-huh. Interesting. So um, one of the exciting things going on that I didn't mention with your association now with uh, Mindy Kaling is that uh, she has the first option to develop books that she uh, that are on her imprint that uh, bear her imprint into feature films and now a lot a lot of books get optioned and so on and never made but uh it's got to be pretty exciting to know that um she thinks in those terms uh and there's an might be an opportunity there so is your next book going to be a mindy kaling on on her imprint or you know, like going forward is the expectation that it will be the same imprint or could it be jumping around other imprints you know, at this point, uh, we're just going to have to stay tuned because I'm not, um, you know, I all of that stuff is still being worked out. But I am excited and stay tuned is all I can say. <laughs> well, congratulations on your success. You obviously have, have done a, a terrific job at building a career. It sounds like you you ha also have fun doing what you do, the the romance, the laughter. Uh, but at the same time, you know, as as we talked about, you uh, you don't skirt major themes or, or heavy themes. Um, before we wrap up, I just wanted to say, uh, is there um, anything you wanted to add or anything about uh, Sonali Dev that uh, people would be surprised to know? I first thank you so much for having me and uh, you know and and for for seeing um, you know with such wisdom, <laughs> what I'm trying to do, because that's exactly what I'm trying to do. I, I think uh, everything you need to know about Sonali Davis in her books uh, or anything that matters, because I do, you know, I, I do leave it all or try my best to leave it all on the page. And my books come um, from a place of what I want to say um, and what I think, um, you know, I, I want people to hear and, um, and and I don't hold back. And so I hope that touches people and brings something to their lives and helps them, uh, you know, feel the gamut of human emotions in a safe space. Sonali, thank you for coming on the program. Thank you so much, Mike. I had so much fun. <laughs>